Attention all cars broadcast 18, a fire at 1517 East 1st Street, damage $147,000. The fire department suspects a pyromaniac. All cars will cooperate with the arson bureau. Go get him, boys. That's all. Rose and Rose. of police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and motorcycles is vital to public safety. In Southern California and Arizona, more of this equipment depends on Rio Grande cracked gasoline than all other brands combined. This is the same gasoline that you can buy at any Rio Grande service station at the price of ordinary non-premium gasoline. Rio Grande cracked was one of the first gasolines to be offered the public containing tetraethyl at no additional cost. Since then, many other companies have been forced to follow suit. The word cracking is the name of a scientific process designed to give you a more powerful and more economical fuel. Rio Grande forces the crude oil into enormous fills, 100 feet high. And under terrific heat and pressure, the gasoline fractions are cracked into millions of atoms. This process is repeated again and again until the final product, the Rio Grande cracked gasoline you buy from your neighborhood dealer, is so concentrated that every drop is vital power. When you fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline with Petra Ethel, you are getting a product that is a breath of the time, guaranteed to deliver to you motor power, speed, and dependability at no extra cost. Try a thankful for more. Once more, it is our pleasure to introduce Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever stopped to think in the quiet of your home after putting down your newspaper? Weary from leaving the daily routine of news concerning fires and crimes against persons and property, what would happen if you had no police and fire departments? That is the thought with which to test your imagination. Particularly in these days when economic stress has tremendously increased the burden of these two indispensable functions of government. The protectors of your home your property, and the lives of your family and yourself, the police and fire departments. The story we have to tell you tonight deals with the strange and little-known insanity of pyromaniacs, unfortunates whose peculiar brain quirks cause them to set fire to people's property just to see the sparks fly, and to see great flames leap heavenward in their mad desire to satiate their peculiar longings. Our arson squad, which works conjointly with the fire department, is constantly working on cases involving this strange mania. It is perhaps the most difficult type of detective work done by this squad because the persons who set fire for a profit or revenge do so deliberately, leaving many clues to their identity. The pyromaniac, on the other hand, has the cunning of madness and covers his criminal fire setting so carefully that only detectives trained in the investigation of arson cases is capable of tracking him down. I have chosen tonight's story to give the citizens of Los Angeles a vivid picture of how difficult it is to discover the operations of a pyromaniac. This story is a true one, and the characters in it are actual persons. And now, Frederick Lindsley will go on with the story. <laughs> In tonight's dramatization, we shall review the case of a Los Angeles pyromaniac, or firebug. 
whose lust for excitement destroyed $147,000 worth of property in a few days. It is September of 1924. Thomas McGee, a high official of the Southern California Edison Company, brings a young man of pleasant appearance to his home. He leaves the boy a moment as he goes to greet his wife. Oh, Tom, you're home early this evening. Hello, my dear. Well, I have a little surprise for you. Surprise? What is it? I'm engaged to show for you. I think he's just the man we've been looking for. He's cultured and educated, and he's a handsome devil, too. Oh, well, where is he? He's down in the living room. So shall I have him come up? Well, I'll send Marie. Marie? Marie? There's a young man waiting in the living room. Will you show him up here? Marie. Colorful background, this chap has, too. He's the eldest son of the flying Sinosa. The flying Sinosa? <laughs> well, I can see that name doesn't register with you as it does with me. You know, my dear, when I was a boy, the flying Spinozas were my idols. Big time trapeze artists. There just wasn't a first rate circus without the flying Spinoza. Oh, I see. Uh, Doris, this is Ed Spinoza. Ed, this is Mrs. McGee. How do you do, Edward? How do you do, Mrs. McGee? I understand you're to be my driver. Yes, madam. Well, I hope you're careful, Edward. I've become very nervous with reckless driving. Oh, I'll be careful, Mrs. McGee. I'll do my best to please you. Oh, I'm certain you'll succeed. Oh. For a while, it seemed that Ed would succeed. He was diligent and courteous and performed his duties smoothly and unobtrusively. Some weeks later, Mr. McGee gave him a more responsible position, that of Chief Watson at the Edison Company's garage at 1570 East Street. He and the men under him are responsible for the hundreds of company cars stored there. Ed works with his usual quiet competence. Then, on the night of November the 12th, fire breaks out. Fire engines, chemical cars, and long, sleek battle wagons fly screaming through the deserted streets. The red-looking demons of flame are feasting on gasoline and will not be subdued. The searing fingers of flame dart from car to car like things alive. Los Angeles stirs into the street and wonders at the sirens and bells screaming and clanging in the night as the third alarm brings out all equipment into action. Before the fire is finally subdued, the entire west wing of the huge garage, with all the automobiles at hell, has been destroyed. Fire Chief Ennis and Captain Paul T. Wolf of the Arson Bureau confer in the smoking shell of the ruined wing. Well, Wolf, what's the verdict? Arson. This fire was set deliberately. How do you know? Look at that wall. See that black burn streak? It leads up to the skylight. Yeah. And the first cars to burn started with the top. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, sure, it's a fence. Someone poured gasoline from that skylight on top of the car. Some of it dripped down the wall there and made that streak where it burned. Who did it? Now, that's another question. I haven't had time for much investigation. All hands have been busy getting this thing under control. Ed Spinoza, the fellow in charge here, got some nasty burns. Mm. Not much left out here, is there, boys? Well, Mr. McGee, we thought you'd gone home. No, I've been trying to make a rough estimate of the damage. Looks as if it'll run about $60,000. <laughs> Not so good. Uh, Mr. McGee, we're, we're quite certain that this is a case of arson. More than that, the work of a pyromania. Well, what leads you to that conclusion, Captain? Well, when a person sets a fire for profit or revenge or any more or less normal motive, he goes to elaborate plans, time fuses, candles, Shading, gunpowder, and all that sort of thing. But he usually leaves a lot of evidence behind. That the pyromaniac just throws gasoline on something and lights it. It's so beautifully simple that it's much harder to catch him. Mm, I see. What about the watchman working here, Mr. McGee? Well, they've both been here a long while, Chief. And they're loyal and dependable. Mm, what about Sonoza? He hasn't been here very long. But he was in my personal employ before he came here, and I can vouch for him. He's a good, clean-cut boy. Well, let's get him over here. Oh, uh, Ed. Yes? Come here a minute. Okay. No, gentlemen, I can't believe that any of our boys would do this thing. The company treats its employees well, and the result is... Mr. McGee? Oh, we just want to talk to you, man, Dad. Uh, how the burn? Oh, I got some pretty good blisters on my hands and arms, but I doused oil on them. They'll be all right. Well, I'm glad it's no worse. Say, Ed, uh, did you or either of your men go up on the roof tonight? No, we never go up there. Well, somebody set this fire, Ed. 
Have you any idea who it could be? No, I haven't. Except uh, except what? Well, just a few days ago, I had a fight with a fellow. And he made a lot of threats. Uh-huh. Who was the fellow? I don't know his name. He's short and thick set and has a beard like... Oh, like a rush. Well, so where does he live? Around oh, the neighborhood someplace. I don't know just where. Yeah, well, uh, did you tell anybody about this fight? Yes, I, I told old John, one of the watchmen. Uh, is he around? Sure. Oh, John. Oh, John. Over. Uh, John will back me up. Oh, we don't doubt your word, Ed. It's just sometimes a little detail slip. Uh, you watch me? Uh, yes, John. Uh, do you remember Ed telling you about a bite he got into a few days ago? Well, yes. Uh, he said this fellow was a sort of a Russian, and he made a lot of threats and such. Mm. Well, I guess there's not much more we can do here tonight. Mm. Let's go home, dear. Well, good night, Mr. McGee. Good night. Uh, good night, Ed. Uh, good night, Captain. <laughs> neighborhood again thrills to the charging fire engine. As a fire breaks out in the abandoned Big Four Depot, used as a shelter by tramps and vagrants. Captain Wolf visits the scene of the fire and finds no evidence of arson. But he does find someone he knows assisting the firemen in fighting the flames. Well, Ed, <laughs> did you get enough fire and smoke last night? Oh, hello, Captain. Well, you see, I heard the rumpus and I thought I'd help put it out. Oh, I see. Say, Ed, have you seen that uh, Russian fellow around that you had the scrap with? Uh, no. Well, be sure to let me know if you hear from him. And Ed Spinoza does hear from the mysterious Russian the very next night, November 14th, and immediately calls his employer. I'll get it, Doris. Hello. Who? Oh, yes, Ed. What's the matter? I see. Well, I wouldn't make too much of it, Ed. Probably just some crank. Uh, have your men keep an extra sharp watch, and don't worry. Oh, no, I don't mind. You did just the right thing to call me. Good night. What is it, Tom? Ed Spinoza had a threatening call down at the garage. Someone rang up and said, I failed the other night, but tonight... Oh, uh, Tom, you don't think... That. I think that Ed is unduly excited. He is unduly excited. There are a lot of cranks around, you know. A lot of cranks around, you know. If he keeps a sharp watch, nothing will happen. <laughs> But Ed is not content with merely keeping a sharp watch. He makes another telephone call, this time to the police station. Hallbeck Police Station, Sergeant Downey speaking. Well, what time is it? Well, what do you say? Oh, I see. I'll send some men right over. Say, what's your name? Spinoza? All right, Mr. Spinoza. There'll be no fires tonight. Oh, Johnson. Yes? Uh, take three of the boys, uh, and stake out that garage at 1517 East First, where they had that big fire the other night. Someone just rang up there and threatened to burn it again. Bring in any suspicious characters you find lording around. Okay. The officers keep a close watch for hours and see nothing to arouse their suspicion. At 3.40 on the morning of November 15th, they return to the Hollandbeck station. Exactly seven minutes later, at 3.47, fire breaks out in several places in the main wing of the Edison garage. Once again, the roaring, screaming engine speeds through the shattered streets with men clinging to them like insects. One alarm! The main thing of the garage is doomed as hundreds of cars burn. Two alarms! More and more operated. 
More and more men are poured into East First Street to reinforce the gallant little band that is struggling against the crackling, glaring monster. Three alarms! Now the fire engines are guided in their mad rush by the ominous red glare of the flames against the sky. Chief Ennis and Captain Wolf are accompanied by Detective Lieutenant Jack Gooding and George Price of the fire department. The center of the building is completely destroyed before the fire is subdued. It is a bewildered group that gathers in the office to review the situation. Well, boys, about 87000 in damages this time. $147,000 gone up in smoke in two days. It's a lot, Mr. McGee. There will be more if we don't get the fun of the business. What about the phone call, boy? I'm just coming to it, Chief. Uh, what time did you say it came, Ed? A quarter to twelve. I know because the alarm clock was right here. Where was the water? Well, if you see, Lieutenant Duty, ever since the fire the other night, I've been sending them back to the alley. One man on each side of the building. They flashed their lights to meet in the alley. Old John here and Mac were back there when the call came. Oh, I should think they would hear a telephone bell ring from there. Now, how about it, John? Did you hear a phone bell? You know, we'll go, Captain Wolf. I, I did hear a bell ring, but I didn't know for sure it was a telephone. Well, why not? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, kind of funny. I don't get what you mean, John. Well, uh, it was like a telephone, and then it wasn't. Well, that's a help. Now, let's see yet. Uh, which one of these phones did you say the call came on? This one. Oh, you must be mistaken, Ed. No, I'm sure, Mr. McGee. Well, why do you think he's mistaken, Mr. McGee? Well, you see, Captain Wolf, this is a private phone for outgoing calls only. So it couldn't have been this one. Well, that's the one that came over, just the same. Mm-hmm. I've got an idea. Uh, Chief, would you and Mr. McGee and Spinoza step outside just a minute? Jack and I have something to take up with John here. Oh, I, I, I ain't done nothing. Honest, I don't know nothing about now, it. Now, don't get excited. Wait a minute. Shut that door, will you, Jack? Well, uh, uh, really, Captain, honest to God, I didn't... Why, of course, Mr. Jack. I just want you to listen while I ring this alarm clock. Just wait till I get it set. Yeah, now, there she is, now. Is that anything like the bell you heard when the call came? Well, yes, uh, that's kind of like it. Yeah. Come on, Jack. We're going over to the telephone office. Right over here, officer. The operator was quite upset by this time, but I know she'll do all she can to help you. This is the young lady. Mm, how do you do? Uh, we want to take a call that was made on the private line into the office of the Edison Company Garage. Well, there was only one call there all night. A man called in that phone and wanted to place a call. He said, came in there. He seemed mad or excited or something. Else. And what did you tell him? Well, I just told him there hadn't been any call. I said, you must be mistaken, because the line was only for outgoing calls. Well, then? Oh, he said the most terrible things. I couldn't tell you the names he called me and the things he threatened to do. Why, it was awful. I see. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, come on, Jack. Let's get back to the garage. I think we've got your man, Mr. McGee. Who? Spinoza. It can't be, Captain. I tell you, that boy is... I'm sorry, but it looks bad for him. I want you to send him on his round, so we don't nothing to happen. But why? We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. If he's innocent, okay. If not, he needs just a little more rope to do a first-class job of hanging himself. All right. Oh, yeah, but... Yes, Mr. McGee? Uh, you better take your clock and make the rounds on the mezzanine and keep your eyes open. Okay. I... I still think you're mistaken. Maybe I am, Mr. McGee. We'll see. That telephone call... I was... know it doesn't look good, but there are lots of... Oh! Help! 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 Wait, Ed! Ed, what's happened? What's happened, Ed? Well, uh, come on, uh, upstairs, boy. Ed, are you hurt? What's happened up there? She's up there. She attacked me. She hit me with a blackjack. See? She jumped out of that closet. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this one here? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. That's about three feet wide and about five feet high. He'd have to be too good in a pretty cramped position, wouldn't he? Yeah, I guess he was. The floor's all covered up with shoes, too. He couldn't have been very comfortable. Look, here's where he broke the railing when he threw me against it. And he broke the step on my time clock. Strong, oh, wasn't he? Like an athlete. Look where he hit me on the head. Right there. See that cut? I feel that bump. I don't see. Why, of course you did. Jack, it's a bad one, too. The one that didn't knock you out, Ed. Well, I, I keep in good shape. 
I can take a lot of punishment. Yeah. Where can he escape to? Well, there's only the stairs that Ed came down. There's this pile ladder right to the roof. That's right. Some of the boys must be up there yet. Well, let's take a look. Now, Mr. McGee, you stay here with Ed and Price. Please. I'd like you to come up top and check on me. Be careful getting off that ladder there. That's it. Uh, now, look, Jack. Flash your light down here. See? No footprints at all in the sand. Let's see if the boys saw anyone. Hey, boys. Hey, boys. Yeah, coming. Oh, hello, Chief. Hello, Captain. Just checking up before we knock off. Have you seen anyone up here in the last few minutes? No, sir. Well, let's see uh, how he could have gotten down in case he came up with the boys in the sand. Well, there's a drain pipe over here. Yeah, let's have a look at it. Ah, uh-huh, here it is. Here, give me that flash. See? There's a mess of telephone wires right down below here. Anyone going down the drain pipe would have to cross them. He'd be bound to tag them and maybe break a few, and they're all in place. You mean it's all a put-up job by Spinoza himself? It looks that way. Well, where's your proof? Well, did you notice the steps going up to the mezzanine? There were only two sets of footprints, one going up and one coming down, and both Spinoza's. And the man shouldn't help leaving prints with all that scar junk around here, huh? Yeah, and then in the closet, the floor was covered with shoes, and none of them looked as though they'd been tramped on. That's why I stopped you when I... When you said there was no wound on his head, Jack. But there was no wound. I know. We have to humor him. And after all, there was a broken rail on the strap. We'll go down now and see what happened. Then did you find anything? No, it couldn't have gone up there. Then he must still be in the building. It looks that way, doesn't it, Dad? You better keep it south watch. Maybe I'd better make the rounds in the east wing. That's the only one left, isn't it, Ed? Yes, that's the only one left. Well, give a yell if you're running out of trouble. I will, Captain. Well, what's this you're going to do, Captain? I, I don't understand. There's no time to explain now, Mr. McGee. It's either Ed or that Russian, and we've got to find out which one it is. Come on, Jack. We're going to follow him. <laughs> on this car and there's gas all over the floor. The game's up, Ed. Well, what do you mean? Come on, Ed. What's the use of stalling? We know you did it. Why, now, now listen, Captain. Uh, just be logical. Look at these burns. They hurt. I got them fighting these fires. Would I like fires and then go and get burned fighting them? Now, would I? Yes, Ed, you would. Huh? Come along. Come along. Three days of constant questioning, Ed Spinoza stoutly maintains his innocence, in spite of the unbroken chain of evidence against him. Hour after hour, the questioning continues, without making any seeming headway. Then, for no apparent reason... All right, boys. I... I guess we've been at this long enough. I did it. I set the fire. I'd have told you earlier, only that fellow there made me sore when he said he'd seen me in the gallery. I've never been mugged. And his bluffing like that made me think you didn't have anything on me. But why did you set the fires, Ed? McGee was good to you. You had a good job. Oh, you wouldn't understand. I think you would, Ed. You couldn't, unless you were born that way. I'm different from you, fellas. Well, how do you mean? Well, it's something that comes over you gradually. It's like having some crawling thing alive inside of you. The muscles of your stomach get all tight. And then it spreads to your chest till you can hardly breathe. Your face twitches and your throat's dry. And you're all tense and jumpy. And it feels like the muscles all over your body are tied up into hard knots. You, you think you're going to die unless you can relax. But you can't relax without excitement. You've got to see an accident or a bloody fight. Or best of all, a fire. The only thing about a fire, you watch it burn and crackle... And at the same time, you feel as refreshed as though a cool, clear stream of water was pouring over you. You feel all calm and languid. And then you kind of realize what you've done. And you want to help put the thing out. But you know you're going to do it again. 
I'm going to do it again. Nothing can stop me from doing it again. Edward Spinoza was committed to the state hospital for the insane at North. For six weeks, he was a model inmate and caused no trouble. Then one day, another inmate conceived a cruel joke in his warped and distorted mind. The guards are gone. What have you been trying to tell me? Hey, Ed, I heard them talking about you. What did they say? Oh, they were saying something about a new kind of operation. They were going to dry out on you. New kind of operation? What do you mean? They do the same thing for rabbits and guinea pigs and dogs sometimes. They got to try it out on somebody. And you're the guy. Are you sure? Sure, I am. I tell you. Say, they can't do that to me. Operation? I'm not a rabbit. I'm not a guinea pig or a dog. I'm Ed Spinoza, the flying Spinoza. That's who I am. They can't do that to me. I'm going to get out of here. Right this minute. That's what I'm going to do. Let me out of here. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Ed, for goodness sake, will you control yourself? You can't operate on me. I'm not a guinea pig. Let me out of here. Oh, listen. Nobody's going to operate on me. Oh, get out of my way. Oh, listen, Ed. You're all wrong. I'll kill you, sir. Come on. Grab him. Hold his other arm. Now, now, come on, Ed. Listen to us, will you? No, Rabbit, let me out of here. Who told you anything about an operation? I was only fooling me. Go get a rabbit for your operation. Get a rabbit! I'm Ed Spinoza. I'm going to get out of here. You can't do this to me! Get here! You can't do this to me! Edward Spinoza became so violent as a result of the cruel, insane jest that it was necessary to strap him to a bed in a barred cell. In the morning, he was gone. With his tremendous natural strength, augmented by the superhuman strength of the maniac, he had not only burst the straps which held him, but had tied the bars of the window apart. He has never been found or heard of since. Unless he has died in the intervening ten years, he remains a constant and deadly menace to society. One regards the pyromaniac with pity. The diseased mind is not responsible for its impulses and actions. But one must also bear in mind that the pyromaniac presents a dire, dreadful threat to both life and property. It is necessary for all law enforcement officers, as a part of their duty, to keep a constant surveillance over all persons, both adults and juveniles, known to have tendencies to set fires. As a result of this watchfulness, this community is now practically free of this menace. We would like to say in closing that most of the names used in these broadcasts are fictitious, although the cases are accurate in all essential details. Ladies and gentlemen, are you getting all the efficiency and power from your car that the manufacturer intended you should get? Modern motors are built to give you quick getaways, surging power, instant start. But they cannot deliver these advantages with inferior gasoline. Why not test your car? You'll quickly find out what it can do if you try a tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline with Tetra Epo. This great motor fuel will bring out the best in an automobile. It has proved its ability by powering more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and motorcycles operated by cities and counties in Southern California and Arizona than all other brands combined. If you want to know the truth about your car, Rio Grande Cracks with Tetra Ethel will tell you whether you need repairs or a change in gasoline. And remember, Rio Grande Cracks with Tetra Ethel costs no more. Next Wednesday, at the same time, Keith Davis will bring you another authentic dramatization from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. Tell your friends about the sensational broadcast, presented by Rio Grande, not only for your interest in pleasure, but also as a contribution in the interest of public safety and crime prevention. Broadcast 18 regarding a pyromaniac. 
Looks like delivered to a psychopathic hospital. <clears throat> That's all. Roll, Jesus. <laughs> 